Thank you, Mr Speaker. How on earth did I end up in the 58th Parliament of New South Wales? Because it is no secret to anyone who knows me that I've never ever wanted to be a politician. I've never strived for that. I've never plotted a course to be here, yet here I am, class of 2023. This boy from the western suburbs of Sydney, born in Auburn Hospital in 1973, but Auburn's not on the northern beaches. A son of a high school maths teacher aged just 22, a mum aged just 19. Yes, I was a honeymoon baby, I think. My grandparents were in their mid to early 40s and I was the first born, the original of the species, first grandchild, first child. We lived in Marylands, and not, again, not a suburb of the Northern Beaches, until my sister was born four years later and soon we moved to Greystones. Again, not Northern Beaches and further away. A lifelong cricket tragic, U2 and Bono fan, some say stalker. <laughs> Tribute question, Mr Speaker, 32 times I've seen them and plus one Bono solo show just recently but I do digress. I am a self-confessed Northern Beaches blow-in who was fortunate enough to end up marrying a Harbord fresher girl born at Manly Hospital, thus giving me my visa stamp, permanent residency, <laughs> to God's own playground. Love you, Bronwyn, and thanks for all you do. And as a child, I'd always wanted to live on the beaches. My dad would pack up the family car every other Sunday for our pilgrimage to the coast. Saturday was for cricket, Sunday the beach. And now look at this, proudly representing this beautiful area in state parliament an MP for goodness sakes. And what an incredible honour it is to stand here in this place, the oldest parliament in the country to represent the amazing people of Wakehurst and indeed the state of New South Wales. And in doing so as a proud independent, I acknowledge the diverse political history of our electorate represented by only five individuals before me, including one Labor member, Tom Webster, who joins us today. Welcome, Tom. And also, of course, my immediate presser, predecessor, the Honourable Brad Hazard, who was to join us, but had to cancel at last minute unlike Brad, and it wasn't COVID. <laughs> Brad, I know you still read Hansard every night, so I thank you for your service <laughs> to our community and to thank the state and for your gracious handover. And, and seriously, thank you for the gracious handover you've provided for me and my team. I acknowledge the other former members of Lakers, John Booth, Alan Viney, and our first ever member, Dick Healy. In Mr Healy's first speech to Parliament, delivered in 1962, his top issues were the bus crisis, the local <laughs> hospital, and the Minister for Transport, I note, is here and she's on the case, don't you worry. The lack of school planning and, of course, affordable housing. 60 years later, that list sounds awfully familiar. I've been reading through a few speeches, few first speeches from members in this place, and a recurring theme seems to be a detailed explanation of who they are, what motivates them and what they hope to achieve. And when asked what drives me, I reflect back on my almost 50 years on this planet, and it turns out it's all the little things along the way that you don't even realise at the time are shaping you the people who love us and sadly leave us, the, moment, the people who shape us with, and with, work with us much and mentor us, the lessons we learn and the lessons we teach. It's the mates we choose and the music we listen to. It's the sport we play and how we play it. It's the decisions we make every day, big and small. And I hope to share with you just some of those formative stories this evening. To begin those stories, it's right to acknowledge the country and I so pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Enora Nation on whose lands we gather and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. On the northern beaches, there is an ongoing conversation about the Indigenous history of our area, and at the moment there's no one to actually acknowledge. But again, I pay my respect and gratitude to custodians past, present and emerging. As part of that acknowledgement, I recognise the sorrow that has been caused over generations and I express my hope for true, genuine reconciliation in the future. And as Mayor of our community, I've had the privilege of working with many local Aboriginal leaders, and in particular, I'm so inspired by our young Indigenous leaders. So hello to, uh, to Noah and Alita in the audience in the gallery tonight. And I share their desire for all of us to work together, to listen, to learn and to walk gently on this earth as we learn from each other, because it is so important. Wow, Wakehurst, just wow. Look what we went and did. <laughs> you wanted change and we got change. The first independent MP for Wakehurst. You wanted integrity and transparency. You wanted local issues dealt with, not ignored. You wanted to be heard, and heard you will be. The government has said, this parliament, like the election, will be a contest of ideas. It will be about working with each other and not against, and not a race to the bottom. Although we just saw our first division ever tonight. On behalf of the people of Wakehurst, I'll be looking for exactly that approach. That's what they have come to expect from their local council and from me personally. 
and that's what I intend to bring to this parliament. A track record of working with any government and any community group and simply getting the job done. It's actually not difficult, but it requires hard work and determination. And having had the honour of serving our community as Mayor of Awesome Town for nearly 15 incredible years, many may think my journey to this place is actually pretty typical. In fact, it's anything but, it's anything but because it's, while there's been some, including my high school principal, Mr Carroll, who will be thinking, I told you so, there will be others looking on now in disbelief. Some of them are actually in the gallery tonight. <laughs> in terms of the naysayers, I'm thinking of my year 11 history teacher who said I'd never make anything of myself, and also the head PE teacher who took an instant dislike to me because I was allowed to wear basketball boots to school when everyone else had to wear proper black leather clerks. At the time, they didn't make clerks in size 14, so what's a boy to do? <laughs> didn't help matters with my PE teacher that my dad was a local high school teacher just up the road and when not playing cricket or soccer himself, he would volunteer to referee the inter-school matches as an independent umpire. So when he made decisions that didn't go the way of my school, I copped my fair share of, how should we say, physical intimidation and sledging, even from my own PE teacher and my schoolmates. But as, and as a referee or an umpire, he forced the rules and the spirit of the game. My dad always taught me to play hard but fair and to respect the rules and the spirit of the game, always. But back to my history teacher. I still remember the day my best mate and I were kicked out of the class before we even got through the front door. The teacher took a preemptive strike and asked us to leave before we even sat down. So we just gladly headed off to the basketball court. That's where Mr Carroll, the principal, soon found us and asked why we weren't in class. Mr Carroll pulled me aside and said, mate, we all learn differently. School isn't for you. I'd gone from the top 10 student at the, year of, at the end of year 10 to the bottom five within six months in year 11. There are lots of reasons and excuses for that. Alas, Principal Carroll saw past all of that and told me to get a full-time job. He said that if I did get a full-time job, he would give me a completion certificate for year 11. Challenge accepted. I was already doing over 30 hours a week as a casual checkout assistant at Kmart, but according to OHS, I was too tall and probably chatted too much to the customers so I got sent to the back of the cash office and was offered a full-time position as a trainee manager, back when bank card was um, a thing. <laughs> Fortuitously, a job at the City of Sydney came up as a clerk in the engineers department. Much more interesting and a genuine challenge, I thought. So as it turned out, an absolute sliding doors moment, if ever there was one. I met my first wife, Michelle, there at council and we had two children, James and Alexander, my two most favourite humans on this planet. James and Alex, I know the journey has not been easy on you too but this is actually all about you. Everything I've done in my public life, in fact, all of our lives, and it's been most of your life, has been by and largely for you and for your generation. I want you growing up in a world where the environment is protected and nourished, where you and your families can thrive, where politics is done differently and done better, where differences are celebrated and all people are respected. Imagine that kind of a world. As naive or cliched as it sounds, I genuinely want to make this world a better place, to ensure you have the opportunities I had and that many people in this place have had. I love you both to the stars and beyond, and I'm, in I'm incredibly proud of what you two lunatics are doing with your lives. James, a second year apprentice mechanic and a car nut, I just need to win you over in the brilliance of EVs. <laughs> and Alex, finishing year 12, trying your hand at TAFE as an apprentice electrician, or maybe a shares trader, or maybe a personal trader. I love that, it, like me at your age, you don't really know what you want to do yet, but you'll give anything a go. Don't worry, son, the job will eventually find you. Eventually. Just try everything and have fun. Say yes to, over, say yes to every opportunity and never, ever burn bridges. Now back to that sliding doors moment accepting the job at City of Sydney. Because local government has been a big part of my life, firstly as a bureaucrat. Always saying yes to the various job opportunities thrown at me and even creating new ones in some cases but gee, you learn quickly in local government. Empathy and the ability to listen are the skills I value most from my time in local government. I soon saw and loved the unique roles <coughs> council plays in helping people and supporting local businesses, and I was hooked. So to the many people working in local government and have helped me along the way and who I've learnt from every day, thank you for the support and opportunity, because that was the first 20 years of my life, pretty much. So then becoming the Mayor of Warringah. In 2007, a group of us residents in Warringah wanted a fresh start for our council as we came out of administration. I just wanted better cricket pitches. <laughs> they were rubbish. So my teammates said, I could do a better job than this administrator. Run for council, they said. My reply, great idea. Why not? 
So I teamed up with the residents and I said, I play my part. Everyone wanted change, but few were in a position to put, actually put their hand up to be a councillor. I then stupidly missed a meeting and they nominated me for the contest for the first popular elected mayor of Warringah. <laughs> Don't worry, they said. You won't get elected as the mayor. There are 12 others running. No one even knows who you are. I was elected the mayor. <laughs> Another sliding doors moment, and I will always be grateful for those who encouraged me in those initial stages in our efforts to do politics differently on the Northern Beaches. My eight years of Mayor of Warringah was then followed by a community campaign to unite the Northern Beaches and become one council. In the statewide forced amalgamations of 2016, it was first proposed to split Warringah, creating two smaller councils, which went against logic, geography, and most importantly, the wishes of our community. And I'm proud of the leadership, road that, the leadership role that I took in ensuring a bad political decision to split our community was overturned and then instead the, United, the, the Northern Beaches was united as one. My own personal journey also continued as I then became the first mayor of that new unified council. How fortunate I am. But my success in local government was our community success and it really was a team effort by a number of people. So this evening I'd like to thank my fellow councillors past and present the orange candidates at four different elections who put their hand up to support our community team, most of them knowing they wouldn't get elected but wanted to support us and propel us over the line. The Clayton's political party and all our supporters and volunteers initially wake up Warringah, then your Warringah, then your Northern Beaches, but simply the orange people. You know who you are. <laughs> the elders who I learned so much from, Emeritus Mayor Julie Sutton, OAM, former councillors Phil Coleman and David James, the professionals working in the local government sector, from the CEOs to childcare staff, events managers, town planners, waste collection officers, incredible people working in local government. Thank you. I'm so proud of what our community achieved together at both Warringah and then the Northern Beaches Council because it culminated in winning the AR Blewett Award as the best metro council in all of New South Wales. Twice. One for each of the councils I was lucky to lead. What I'm most proud of though is how we supported our community through our those challenging years of COVID and through the recovery process we are still enduring. That's another story to be told for another day. But what drove me at all times in my role as Mayor was that sense of service, of helping others, of finding genuine solutions to improve our community. I can't just sit back and throw stones at the tent. I want to be in that tent helping to solve the problems, be part of the solution. The more complex, the better. I know exactly where this sense of service came from, my family and my upbringing. My mum and dad are sadly no longer with us, but I was so blessed to have them both show me the way. Each, in their own style, taught me so much. Dad, the maths teacher, constantly giving me of his time and his skills to others. I hate that I didn't fully appreciate him and his sacrifices until we lost him. Gone at just 48 years of age. Having fought off melanoma as a teenager in the 1960s, it came back for him a few decades later. I think that, every, that early brush with death compelled him to live life to the full. He had so much love for his siblings, his mates, his nieces and nephews, and of course, his four children. Susie and I, and then Ashley and Andrew a bit later, just eight and six when he died. But yeah, I hate that he never got to meet any of his five grandsons, and I'm acutely aware that I've out, already outlived him. And my mum, what to say about mum? Again, I didn't realise how much she was showing me at the time about family, about love, about sacrifice. Again, taken so, too soon just a few years ago, cancer again. I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by family on both sides who taught me a sense of what is right, to speak up, to act. Mostly they were strong, vocal women, and I'm so grateful for that. I have my beautiful Auntie Deb and Auntie Beth and Auntie Olga here tonight, who I think have been putting up with me the longest, and my stepmum Kim, who's been trying to pull me into line since I was 15. All exceptionally strong women. My sister Susie, who was here from Perth, 45 years of being in each other's space, Thank you for travelling across from Australia to be here. To meet Susie, you'd never know she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis or MS in her early 30s. Her newborn son, my nephew only a few weeks old, and she was told she would be in a wheelchair within five years. She bravely put her hand up for a medical trial and today over a decade later, thanks to science and experimental drugs, she is not only still with us, but she is pretty much cured. And she helped get the drug onto the PBS. She's absolutely changed the game for other MS patients. Susie, their world and my world is a better place because of you. I've got my crazy Queensland relatives, including Uncle Mick, who always taught me not to take myself too seriously. That's clear. 
Those are all those love my campaign colours of maroon, although I insist it was Pinot. <laughs> and of course, my horse and Central Coast cousins and my beautiful uncles over in San Francisco. My family have taught me so much over the years about courage, community service, justice, sacrifice and love. And I, love, and I will be forever grateful for the upbringing I had and the lessons that formed my values and sense of purpose. From Marnie Deb, so nurturing and caring, a surprise to no one that she's dedicated her life to nursing and mentoring others in the medical profession, married one of the Ferugia boys across the road, Uncle Dave, a teacher who became and gave so much and so generously to his students and to his family. Or my Auntie Beth, who back in the early 80s, despite being a six foot tall and passing her exams, was not allowed to join the police force. Guess why? She was married. True story. The decision would prove to be one of the best and worst decisions for the people of New South Wales. Why? Because thanks to a lot of help from a now high profile former officer, she was allowed to join and went on to impact the lives of many victims in her role as a detective in the child mistreatment unit. But in positive ways, she changed those lives, despite the efforts of a very male dominated force that were out to destroy her. As well as that, she reluctantly helped reform the New South Wales police force along with her husband, my Uncle Paul, who was also a police officer of note in the Homicide Squad. They changed the way the force treats their own and their legacy continues to change the lives of our first responders. Then there's my father's brother, Auntie Glenn, as he insists I call him. In 1984, at the age of 23, when I was just 11, Glenn was bashed to within an inch of his life and ended up in intensive care, a victim of a targeted gay bashing. I remember being there when he finally came out of the coma and he told my mum and dad he was gay. He explained to them that this was why he was attacked, but he begged them not to tell Nana and Pop. At that point, my, pa my parents smiled and said, no kidding, you gay. <laughs> they reassured him they were pretty sure his parents already knew. When I reflected on that years later, I thought, how awful. Fancy hiding who you are and then losing the opportunity to come out in his own way, in his own time and control his own story. Robbed of the most basics of rights. I was 11. I didn't really know what a gay man was. I thought he just dressed better than the rest of us and hung out with trendier people. <laughs> and speaking of fashionable folk, my beautiful Aunty Olga, whose family had escaped Russia in World War II and wound up in a refugee camp in Cessnock. I'm pretty sure that's where Aunty Olga was conceived. She's taught all of us about making the most of our opportunities, the importance and strength of family and never forgetting our past. She married my beautiful Uncle Al, who gave so much to his local cr cricket community in Campbelltown, particularly youth development and women's cricket, recognised with a posthumous OAM after we lost him to cancer in 2019. I know how Uncle Al would have loved to have been here tonight. He'd certainly appreciate the tie I'm wearing. The black and gold of the original SCG 11 cricket team. I played with them at the Lords, at the Lords, uh, the day Uncle Alan joined me in the long room for our team dinner. Those who know me know how much I love cricket, but I want to take a moment to explain that passion. It's simply not about the contest of the bat and ball. As thrilling as that is, it's far more than that. Cricket is a big part of my life. The friendships I've made, the wins I've had, the crushing defeats I've dealt with, the travels I've had, but most importantly, the values I cherish. The spirit of cricket has always been virtually important, sorry, has been vitally important to me, and it's why I chose to wear this tie tonight. And the spirit of cricket is hard to define. Many have tried and failed over the years, but I'll give it a go. Mr Speaker, can I ask for a extension of time? I promise I won't be too much longer. I imagine if you'd had to just chat it on, you would have been given it automatically. But I think, I, 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 I think as you've asked so nicely, yes. You're, a, focus, you, you're, you're a good egg, Mixer. You're a good egg. <laughs> you see, cricket's an exciting game that encourages leadership, friendship and teamwork. It brings, it brings together people from different nationalities, different cultures and different religions. The spirit of cricket involves respect for your opponents, your own captain and team, the role of the umpires, the game itself, its traditional values. It involves putting the team ahead of personal interests and milestones. It requires you to play with discipline and control and to be a good example on and off the field. The spirit of cricket is a theme with me and it's now I try and live my life. I also think the spirit of cricket is especially relevant when you look at our parliament. Imagine a parliament that encourages leadership, friendship and teamwork, where all members show respect for colleagues on both sides of the aisle, for the speaker, and for the original values of the Constitution of New South Wales. Imagine a place where the community interest is prioritised ahead of personal interests and milestones, where we all exercise our role with discipline and control, strive to be a good example inside and outside the Parliament. 
My request tonight to the Speaker, to the Premier, to the Opposition and to the Crossbench colleagues is to execute our duties to the people of New South Wales in that exact manner. How about no more attempts at gotcha moments? How about just asking or answering a question without spin? How about we demonstrate to the public that question time is actually a valuable part of our parliamentary process and without the perception it is, or it has now, of the bullying and the intimidation and the immature behaviour? The exact kind of stuff we try to protect our kids from on social media or in the playground. It isn't that hard to do. Substance, work with, not against, support and respect. Is any of that too much to hope for? Or indeed ask for, or even demand? Because I'm pretty sure it's what the community wants. Let's be the parliament that passes the most legislation that works across party lines and every now and again then compromises on things. Because compromise is not a dirty word. Let the 58th parliament be the parliament that gets it done. And that's the challenge. So pat up everybody. <laughs> I'm not naive. I know that Wakehurst and indeed New South Wales faces some really big challenges. Issues that can't be solved by me solely, but can only be solved by coming to this place, ensuring my community's voice is heard and working with all members to find and implement solutions. And the list is long. The lack of affordable housing options, public transport nightmares, the cost of living crisis, environmental challenges and the need for greater action on climate change, smarter planning for our community, local issues like the petroleum exploration permit 11, or PEP 11 as it's been come to know, and how that is still alive is beyond me. But anyway, I'll continue to fight on that one. And the Lizard Rock development, where pristine native bushland is being carved up for housing in the middle of a bushfire zone. Approval was granted despite independent reports stating what a disaster that would be. And the Lizard Rock development is outside any good planning, planning principles and not part of our agreed housing targets. And I'm going to fight to ensure that that approval is overturned. Now, in terms of caring, in terms of caring for the most vulnerable, I want to ensure that in Wakehurst we create a caring, inclusive society. I think of local groups like Zargood of Collaroy, the Cerebral Palsy Alliance, Fusion Pride, Aspect, Gotcha for Life and Fighting Chance. Look them up. Google it. These are just some of the many local groups ensuring the voices of the vulnerable are heard and they are given every opportunity to participate and contribute to society. I see Jo Berry just over here behind the curtain. She's got her own tales to tell. Ask her about her life journey and the awesome Fighting Chance social enterprise that she worked with. Better still, ask her how she swims at Shelley Beach or Collaroy with nothing more than a noodle and her carer. I'm jo, I'm so thrilled you could be here uh, and join us today. It's so great that you've got the best seat in the house just quietly <laughs> down here in the chamber. But it's a sad reality that we can't accommodate her in the chamber, but I do absolutely appreciate the efforts of our parliamentary staff have gone to to ensure Jo is accommodated today. But is it good enough that she can't just come in as a punter and sit and watch in the gallery without others having to fuss over her? So another challenge I now add to the list. And I know the to-do list is not unique to Wakehurst. So don't get me wrong, Wakehurst is unique as it is special. But so is Willandilly, so is Lake Macquarie, Wagga Wagga in Sydney, Barwon, Newtown, Manly, Dubbo, pretty much every, street, every seat. Our communities are diverse. They're all diverse and they're all brilliant. But ultimately, whether they voted red, blue, green, teal, or heaven forbid, orange, <laughs> and Pinot. I think they all want the same things. Transparency, integrity, honesty, opportunity, fairness, common sense, cooperation, and hope. In conclusion, and I know many of you are expecting a quote from Bono, and I won't let you down. <laughs> Some of you have heard it before, but here goes. Vision over visibility. The insistence to look past what you can see in favor of what could be the ability to see what's possible beyond our current reality. And that's the challenge before us. So to the White team, to the Wakehurst team, Regan volunteers and supporters, you guys, you had one job. And you did it spectacularly. And I know, of course, you actually had more than just one job. You all had about 10 jobs each, but we did it. So, and look what we went and did. I share your incredible, infectious excitement and enthusiasm about the change we've created, and I can assure you I am up for that challenge. But there is much more to do, and I need your help on that journey. To Susie Morgan, in particular as my campaign director, or Bossy Spice as we know her, incredible. Thank you, and to you and the whole executive team. To all my family, my sister, my aunts, uncles, cousins, nephews, nieces-in-laws, stepmom, Ash, Andrew, friends, colleagues, teammates, and to my wife, Bromman, and of course, my two awesome lunatic sons. Thank you for all that you've taught me. Thank you for allowing me 
to do what I do. Thank you for letting me be me and for each of you being you. And to the Wakehurst community, on the 25th of March, many of you voted independent for the very, very first time. And I'm so humbled and honoured by that. I thank you for that trust and the faith that I look forward to serving our community. One last by my quote for the road. It's a little known song and one that means a lot to me. And the message is simple. We are the people we've been waiting for. To me, it's reminiscent of Gandhi's message that we be the change we want to see. To the people of Wakehurst, we are the people we've been waiting for. We've seized the moment to create a new destiny, to speak up and to step out for our community. And to my colleagues in this chamber, fellow members of the 58th Parliament, we are the people we've been waiting for. If, like me, you desperately want politics done differently, to be more respectful, more productive, more compassionate, then let's be those be people we've been waiting for. The 58th Parliament is an exciting place to be, full of opportunity and spirit. And can I thank the clerk, it's, it's Regan by the way, not Reagan, <laughs> and all of her parliamentary staff, the former speaker and the current speaker for all the training and guidance and support you provide to us MPs. Seriously, you guys rock. It's truly an honour to be in this place. I will forever be grateful for this opportunity and I intend to use every day to make the most of it for the people of Wakehurst and the people of New South Wales. Thank you.